Now's the time for those who are here to take out the Living Faith Notes. They are available for you. Uh, those that are watching at home, you don't have the notes in front of you. All of you, though, will need to have access to God's Word to see in front of you the text since it's not printed out. So if you have a Bible app on your phone, uh, now will be the time to open it up to Genesis chapter 27. We're going to cover the entire chapter of Genesis 27 and get into a portion of, of chapter 28. Now we're in the second week of this Jacob series, and we're going to talk this, about something that, whether you realize it or admit it or not, is part of our human nature. And because it's part of our human nature, and since we are in a fallen world and we have contributed to the fall, it's skewed a lot. And what th that is, that's part of our human nature, is that every one of us, we think that we ourselves are correct. That how we view life is the way it is. And we think that, that again, we're right. All of us do. Sometimes we are right. But you know, because of sin, because we all have a sinful nature, quite often we're, we're not right, even though we convince ourselves that we are. We're told in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 2, a person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. God knows. God knows your ways. He knows my ways. And I might be convinced that my way is the right way, but again, God weighs the heart. He knows whether my perception is, is based on truth or whether it's tainted by sin. We're told in Proverbs 14, verse 12, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. So it appears to be right. My, my way is the right way, and you might convince others that it is. It may have that appearance, but God says in the end, it could lead to death. And death ultimately is a separation. Well, as we continue our Jacob study and series, we're going to come across four individuals who each thought they were right. That my way or the highway mentality, but as we're going to see, their way actually resulted in the highway. We're going to learn from that, see four examples of people in our text from God's Word who think they're right. They're, they're all believers, by the way. But they all thought they were right, but they were incorrect. Let's begin. Genesis 27, verses 1 through 4. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son... Here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow and go out into the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. So here's Isaac. He's one of the patriarchs. This is Isaac, the, the only natural son of Abraham and Sarah, the, the, the child of the promise that was born to, I, to Abraham and Sarah in their old age. Same person. He is the one, again, that, that God reassured that, that the salvation of the world would, would come through him. And he is old. At least he thinks he's old. And from our text, you might say, well, he is old. He's 137 years old. There's nobody alive today that's 137 years old, right? We would consider that very, very old. But keep in mind, this was 4,000 years ago. And if you study scripture, this was about 400 years after the great flood. And some amazing things happen as we look at the record of scripture. Before the flood, people lived a lot longer than we live. Methuselah lived to be almost a 1,000 years old. Imagine that. Adam and Eve, likewise, lived to be very, very old, but they eventually died. After the flood, according to the biblical record, life expectancy began to be cut almost in half. 
measured in, say, 500 years. And then, and then by the time of, of the patriarchs, Abraham and Isaac, um, it was, could be a few hundred years. So from our perspective, 137 years old, that's old. In his day, not necessarily. But he thought he was old, and he, his eyesight was poor. And in our text, he wants to give his oldest son, Esau, his blessing. And let me explain that a little bit. The blessing of the firstborn. Now, a blessing in the ancient world was more than simply, I want to give you, here's your inheritance, and I want to wish you a good life. It was a lot more than that. It was a contract, a contract that was binding, that, that a father would give to one of his children or to his children, but the right of the firstborn was more. The firstborn typically received two-thirds of the inheritance. Uh, the, the, the firstborn, likewise, would, would keep the family name and would be in the driver's seat. The rest of the siblings would, would, would split the, the one-third that was, that was left over. And it, it seems kind of innocent at first. Isaac, the patriarch, 137 years old, he wants to give the blessing to Esau, his firstborn son. What's wrong with that? And he tells Esau, and by the way, Isaac favored Esau. We read that last week. He loved him more than he loved the secondborn, Jacob, even though they were twins. And Esau was the rugged man, the, the hunter, the one that was out in the field. And so that day, Isaac says, get your equipment. You know what to do. Hunt some wild game. Prepare a meal. And after that meal, I'm going to give you the blessing. It's going to become a binding thing that the blessing belongs to you. And you might again say, what's wrong with that? Isn't he free to do that? Keep in mind from last week's text, when Rebecca was pregnant with the twins and she inquired of the Lord, what's wrong? And God says, you have two nations inside of you. They're struggling already. And then God said to Rebecca, and this is the word of God, God said that the older, the one born first, will serve the younger. That was God's word. The older will serve the younger. It was equivalent for God as saying that the the second born is going to receive the rights of the first born. So that was God's word. Rebecca knew this. The assumption is that Isaac knew this. She would share this information with him. And so for Isaac to say that day and only speak to his oldest son, today's the day, don't tell your mom, don't tell your brother. Now, he didn't say that. It's not recorded in Scripture, but it is secret. He only tells Esau. And today's the day I'm going to bless you. That's not innocent. Rather, that's Isaac trying to get his way. His way or the highway, and he's going to use secrecy to get it. So here's the first fill in. Isaac used secrecy to get his way. Isaac used secrecy to get his way. And again, think of yourself and, and getting your way. Have you ever used secrecy? Then you have a lot in common with the patriarch Isaac. Continuing on, verses 5 and following. Now, Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare some tasty food to eat so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. 
go and get them for me. No, on the one hand, Rebecca is patient with her husband, patient to give the blessing. The blessing, according to the will of God, was to go to Jacob, not to Esau. So she's showing patience with her husband. But now, when she overhears the conversation, she does not have patience anymore. She has to act. Her way is the right way. I must intervene. This is dependent upon me. And in order to get her way, she's willing to use deception. And that's what it was, deception. And that's the second point. Rebecca used deception to get her way. Again, to deceive someone, you have to analyze it for what it is. It's a sin to deceive. I want to back up to verse 11. Jacob said to Rebekah's mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him. (laughs) What's Jacob concerned about? The appearance of tricking. He doesn't care about tricking his father. He just doesn't want to be seen as appearing to trick his father. That was Jacob's hesitation here. His mother said to him, my son, let the curse follow me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. Continuing on, verses 14 through 29. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins, Then she handed to her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made. He went to his father and said, My father, he probably changed his voice a little bit, my father. Yes, my son, he answered, who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord, your God, gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father Isaac. He touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau, he asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought to him and he ate and he brought some wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you, you, give you heaven's dew and earth's richness in abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. And may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. Jacob gets his way. Right? He wants the blessing. He wanted it earlier in his life when he, using deception and trickery, got his brother to sell the birthright to him for a bowl of soup. Remember that? But Jacob, the ends justify the means. I can use trickery and I will get my way. I can lie to my father and get, to, get my way. So this is the the fourth type. So Rebecca, again, used deception. Jacob used trickery to get his way. There's only one person left, and that's Esau. You already know Esau's personality. What is it? Jacob, or Esau's way is instant gratification. I want it here. I want it now. I don't want to wait. Right? He's hungry, appetite. He's famished. I'm going to die. Give me that soup. And his brother Jacob said, sell me your birthright first. 
Okay, I'll sell you the birthright. And he does. Instant gratification, a bowl of soup, satisfy that appetite. That's Esau's way. Esau's way is one of, of instant gratification. Makes me wonder when his dad said, uh, I want you to go out and kill some fresh game first. He's probably thinking, probably uh, thinking, we don't know for sure, but ah, I have to go out there. You know, there's time going by, but it's his day, right? Jackpot. I sold my birthright, but I'm going to get it anyway. And Esau, his way, again, very easy to see. Esau's way was instant gratification, which will lead him to regret and anger. Let's finish it up, verses 30 and following. After Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, my father, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, and I blessed him. And indeed, he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob, heel grabber? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright and now he's taking my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him Lord over you and have made all of his relatives his servants and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. His father Isaac answered him, your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. Verse 41, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Keep in mind that that Isaac will live another, what, 47 more years? Verse 42, when Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau is planning to avenge himself by killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban and Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? You see this. Listen to me. Right, Go away for a while. That's where we are next week when we pick up on this. But getting their way led to separation. Getting their way led to the highway. Literally, Jacob's going to be on the highway. And he's going to be there for a very long time. Now, let's learn more than simply some examples of, again, getting our way. What are some things we can learn from this? And is there a solution for it. First thing I want to learn and say is this. My sinful nature will justify lying to others, myself and God, in order to get my way. My sinful nature will justify lying to God. He sees everything. To others, to myself, to get my way. It's never okay to lie. What a, what a web of deceit insisting upon our way can weave in our personal lives. Second take home is this. There may be some short-term gains 
always insisting, but always insisting upon my way will result in long-term losses. Short-term games, long-term losses. Case in point, Rebecca, right? Listen to me. We got to take this in our own hands. We have to make this happen so that you get the blessing. Short-term game, he received the blessing, Jacob. But long-term losses, what was Rebecca's plan? She said, Jacob, listen to me, the second time, flee, travel hundreds of miles away, and when your brother simmers down, I will send word to you, and you can come back. Do you realize that Jacob, as far as we know from Scripture, will never see his mother again? It wouldn't be a short-lived thing. His brother's anger and wanting revenge would outlive her and would last for years. My way leads to the highway. It leads to separation. And, and, and again, it, it's just a, a dangerous thing. You, you see it turn out. It res, results in long-term losses. Third take-home is this. Trying to force God's will my way is never good. Trying to force God's will my way is never good. Rebecca knew God's will. The older will serve the younger, meaning the son younger will be the one with the birthright. That was God's will. But Rebecca wanted it her way. And again, it did not turn out good for her or, or her son. Now, is there a solution to this dilemma? Again, insisting upon our way, it just complicates our lives. It leads to lying. It leads to justifying sin. Is there any solution? My friends, in the book of Hebrews, written in the New Testament, the writer of the Hebrews commends Isaac for blessing Jacob. God's word commends Isaac for blessing Jacob. How is this possible? And the answer is a person, and that person being Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way. We believe in that. Jesus is the way. But you know what? Jesus did not insist upon his way. Let me explain. Jesus did not insist upon his way. Jesus came into this world some 2,000 years ago to submit to his heavenly Father's way in everything. He submitted to God the Father's will. We see this the night of his betrayal before his death, the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is stressed out because of what is being required of him to suffer for the sins of the world, to be crucified on behalf of everyone. And what did Jesus pray the first time? If there's any other way besides this bitter cup, then that way be done, not this way. And what was God the Father's answer? No other way. Jesus, if he insisted upon his way, would still be alive today. He would be the most powerful, richest person living on earth. He didn't have sin. He wouldn't die because he didn't have sin. But Jesus, the heart of a Savior, was not to insist upon his way. Rather, he submitted to his heavenly Father's way. And that way, God the Father's way, was a very difficult way. It was a way that led to the cross. Voluntarily, giving up his life, substitution and atonement, becoming sin for us, for dying for his ancestors who made poor choices, wanting their way, dying for all sinners, including us, taking our sins upon himself. God's way was the cross, but that suffering and death leads to forgiveness and everlasting life for us. My friends, in every case, as we study God's word, Jesus is the hero. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to Father except through him. And we see in our, our Savior the willingness to, to submit to God's will, doing God's will, God's way, even if it's a very difficult way. 
So as we go forward, again, learn the example from negative examples of people in Scripture. They are real people like us. When you think you're right, and we all think we're right, I think I'm right. I think my judgments are right. Wait a second. Humble yourself. Inquire of the Lord. Lord, weigh my motives. If my motives are based on sin, if I'm justifying sin to get my way, please lead me out of that. Lead me your way. Lord, you are the way, the truth, and the life. My friends, let us see that and willingly ask God's way to be done his way in our lives. Amen. And now may the true peace of God, which surpasses all of our understanding, keep our hearts and minds through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen.